We're talking all about the San Diego goals today, and I've got a special guest, Aaron Cooney, joining us on this edition of Locked On Anaheim Ducks. Your Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Anaheim Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How about that spiffy new intro? Welcome to Locked On Anaheim Ducks or Locked On Goals today, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Jason J.D. Hernandez. Wow, new graphics all around. Um, This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Unlock awesome prizes, cool plane pieces, and hilarious emojis. Download Monopoly Go now on Google Play or the App Store Game On. I'm joined by Aaron Cooney. There we go from... The San Diego goals. He's the goals broadcaster. Uh, Aaron, first off, how's it going? Good. Uh, Jason, you sure you want to waste the the new the debut of all the new graphics on me? It's like it's. I feel like it should be it should be safe for the Ducks guys. No, no, no. You're you're all good there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, things you are good, to, man. How about yourself? Doing well. I'm back after a couple of days off and just enjoying this sunshine for now. I mean, you've seen the uh, weather we've had this year. It's been. I don't. It feels like since I moved out here, uh, even last year in Southern California, it was it was dry, uh, rainy and wet and cloudy, and I was like, "What? This is not what I was promised when I shipped out here." And it's a second year in a row, and I was like, "Okay, this is a little too much." And I got a June gloom coming in next. I know like, this is not yeah. normal. <laughs> I mean, it's San Diego. It's it's beautiful. You got the beaches there. You've got players surfing. Yeah. I don't have to shovel snow and scrape my windshield. I have. I still won't complain. I'll take it. A little rain yeah. doesn't hurt me. Um, I just mentioned surfing, and I'll start off with a little bit of levity before we get to like the meat and potatoes. Yeah. Are there any players that do enjoy the occasional surf? On this there, game? there, there are a few. There. Um, so Josh Lapina is actually so he his family grew up on a lake we actually featured this on on Gauls all access kind of like a deep in, dive into some of the players who sat down with josh lapina so his family grew up he was always going to lake and doing wakeboarding his his sister is actually a world renowned world champion uh wakeboarder um so it's a, it, the natural ath- athleticism is in the family um but when he came out here he has picked up a wetsuit and has done uh it, it's picked up surfing as well and he tried to grab a couple guys to join him i know um Nick Wolf gave it a shot once. I had him on the podcast and then followed up with him. And this is, uh, you know, defensive defense, tough guy. Uh, he, he Not afraid to drop the gloves, giving it a shot. And then the next time I saw him, I was like, hey, you, st- you still kicking the surfing around? He's like, no, it's too good. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to stand up once. I got that. Like, I felt good. But the whole process of putting on the wetsuit and, and, and trying to take it off and then trying to, he's like, it was just, I'd rather just hang out. So of all the guys, yeah. I would not expect Nick Wolf to be on that list. <laughs> and he, he he came out. I know he came out here uh, and wanted to live the life. Hey, you're in Southern California. Try it all year. Yeah. You know? uh, so, but he he's given a shot. And I remember him saying that he was stoked that he got up at least once. So, see, I would kudos to him. Couple, I would expect guys like Chase DeLeo, who's a La Mirada native, or Sasha Pastujov since he's a Florida native, but we'll talk about them in a second. I would expect those guys to take up the big time surfing. The guys that get it. Or, I, yeah. That, you think there may be a few more, but they get so dialed into hockey. And maybe it just wasn't there. We'll get there. Maybe. We'll get more in there. We might just like a field trip, a team field trip uh, to go get, get on the, get on the boards. I can Lessons only imagine. <laughs> I could, I could really think about some of those guys getting on wakeboards that, I mean, imagine Trevor Carrick on a, on a surfboard or you, you need like the longer ones, right? Like for some of these guys, there's some big dudes. You need the, the, the long boards. I would imagine. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, let's actually get into the pat the season that was um, there was a 20 point improvement for the San Diego goals of the season. Didn't make the playoffs, but there was still a market improvement from last season to this season that just took place. If you want to touch on just some of the improvements that were made in general. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it feels like it, and if you took away that 13 game losing skid in right after your first two games of the regular season, all through the month of November, um, you know, this this is a team that's hovering right around 500, a little above in, in terms of points percentage. Um, we saw the improvement in, in you mentioned the, in terms of points, uh, win improvement. I mean, they hit their numbers months before the end of the season compared to the year before uh, in terms of improvement in that way. It's 
you know, and, and that's saying a lot to me because you were coming in with a, a whole new, you know, brand new head coach, um, you know, at one yeah. point, 11 Her, first year. Yeah. For, for, yeah. Three straight years. It, it's fun. I know I, my journey is going to bounce back and forth, but this is the uh, fourth head coach that's been around since that bubble season. So that's hard to have that kind of sustain what's going on. Uh, I would imagine uh, for, for a player in, in, in development, and everything, when the voice kind of changes, but that's kind of, that's been solidified. Uh, so you're changing the culture right off the bat. Uh, at one point there's, there's 11 first year players on this roster who were in either junior or college the year before. I mean, that's, it's one of the, it was one of the youngest teams in the AHL throughout the entire season. That's just, that's tough to do. Um, and to try to maintain that against guys that are learning to play against men. And it's mm -hmm. funny you can see some of the call-ups like uh, when Sam Colangelo, you know, finished his season and came, came pro came the goals first for the you know, ducks um, and just asking him like, what's the biggest difference? And he's like, well, my, my centerman, which was Andrew Agazzino, he's like, well, he's over 30 and has kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. It's, it's, it's fair. Um, it, it's funny so you mentioned Sam Colangelo because I was actually at his first game in San Diego and he had a terrific start. I was hoping to see him for the rest of the season. I mean, he did get called up to the Ducks yeah. in his first game there. But just the little bit that you saw from Sam Colangelo, there's a lot there that he that he's already good at. For sure. And, and he's a guy. I mean, it's it's that kind of the new age kind of power forward, right? The, the guy can skate. He's not afraid to get mm -hmm. in the middle. Look at where he scored his goal for, for the goals. It was going to the, the front of the net and end up kind of drifting out a little bit higher, but he's not afraid to take the puck straight to the front of the net. Um, and that's the biggest thing. You can skate, you got, you have the body, you can make plays. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, it's a really nice piece. I mean, down, down here in San Diego, we we're hoping maybe he'd kick the, the, the last few months, but we understand uh, the, the job that we, that San Diego has in, in, in getting guys ready to go to the Anaheim ducks and, that was a quicker transition than, than we kind of hoped, but boy, the ducks to have that in the, in the prospect pool, just another one of this, this geez, budding prospect pool that continues to get bigger and bigger. It seems like um, it's going to be, there's a lot of tough decisions that the coaching staff's got to make when you come the next year. It's going to be really interesting to see the rookie camp next season down at um, five. Uh, wow. In Irvine down, yeah. there, down at that arena that I can never pronounce for some reason, five points arena. There we and, go. And you're going to add another top. I mean, you're in the lottery, so we were going to. There's going to be another lottery one. pick that's going to be. Yeah, that's. I, I, some of the guys in the office are doing the, uh, you know, the, 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 the online kind of see where it's going to drop out on, on the. I forget the name of the website. So the tankathon. Uh, the tankathon. We've seen that coming through a couple times. So it's like, all right, let's no more tries. It's just just manifest that into us. But yeah, you're going to have another. You got two first round picks this year. Um, a handful of picks throughout the draft. Like you're going to mm -hmm. even add more to that pool that this rookie class in that rookie tournament, you the prospect uh, pool that's coming in for, for the next camp is going to be even bigger. It's going to be phenomenal to watch them all just develop and grow with the team. I hope that's what I'm hoping and, for. And that's been the plan, right? Since they, they decided to you know, you tear things down and, and you build from the ground up and, and that's what it is. And uh, identifying that core, that's going to be, that Anaheim Ducks group that moves forward like you had gets off and Perry for so long. I, I imagine you're going to have that here coming very soon. I mean, there's a slew of <clears throat> ways to grow around certain guys. Like um, I know Trevor Zegris is the big one that people want to mm -hmm. build around and Mason McTavish, but don't forget about guys like Troy Terry. I mean, he had, he had a long contract. He's an all-star. Yep. So there's a lot there. If you don't mind sticking around, we're going to just um, do a quick, intermission and then we'll come back and just get to the real meat and potatoes of this so if you don't mind sticking around because we got to talk about monopoly go well we'll get to the rest of the podcast on the other side now a brief word from monopoly go wherever that is there it is so um it's a great game that you can team up with friends for times tournaments build up boards win together get awesome pieces and, you know, it's fun and exciting every day. There's always new timed events to help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and download it now on Google Play or the App Store today. Game on. We're here with Aaron Cooney, who's the broadcaster for the San Diego Goals. Does a great job. One of the better broadcasters out there. Thank you. That, that means a lot. That means a lot to me. 
as as you know, I do watch a lot of AHL hockey. I watch a lot of different teams. Some that I think, let's put it this way: there are some that have room for improvement. I'll I'll leave it as diplomatic as possible. Everybody has their cup of tea. I'm just thrilled to be part of uh, that brotherhood of broadcasters in the American Hockey League. It's it is a truly a great group of guys, and I, I don't take this lightly. Being the chance uh, to broadcast games again, kind of the way the I was give, given another opportunity at this. So I'm very, very grateful to be part of it. I feel the same way being a brotherhood of public address announcers, um, one of whom that I've run into recently. So it, it's all good. <laughs> okay, I want to get to a couple of these numbers because I did a season by the numbers recently. Mm-hmm. And one of those numbers that I thought I had correct, but I was actually off by one. It turns out that number is 47. If you want to tell our folks what 47 means for this season. Well, it's a, a new San Diego Gauls record, and, and it's it smashed the previous record for consecutive penalties killed uh, in a season. And this was over a 12-game span that they killed 47 consecutive penalties. Um, and a and during that, they went 10 games without allowing uh, a, a power play goal during that stretch. And this was a penalty kill. It, it kind of tailed off a little towards the end of the season, um, but at that point, I mean, quickly shot up the rankings and there was a good couple of weeks there um, that this group through the month of January and February, they weren't allowing that kind of offense. And, and it shows it's the buy-in from one, you had a, a, a great group of veterans. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had the buy-in from youngsters, guys like Nathan Gaucher, um, Josh Lapina is another one that's, that's been playing PK, um, buying into the system and, at the same time, you're you're getting the goaltending, and and I think that was the, some of the interesting stuff between Cali Clang, and it, I mean, three guys were on the roster, but when we turned the calendar over to 2024, it really became Cali Clang and Tomas Sukanik's team to to run the net. Um, I think they kind of identified this is this is kind of the future. Alex Stalock was that veteran presence, that calming presence you had on the bench most nights as he was backing up. Um, only had a handful of starts through the, the the stretch run towards the end of the season, but you're as the old adage goes, your best penalty killer needs to be your goaltender, and they were getting mm-hmm. that too from from two young guys that are in their first full North America first full professional years in North America. Yeah, I think that's a big deal too that we got to just touch on. Is I was impressed with both Kelly Klang and Sukanik, just their progression through the year, and there were some games where they were getting a lot of opportunities to get saves. I mean. There were some games where there was maybe 35 plus shots on goal, but they Mm -hmm. kept their composure and they kept the goals in it. And I think that's one of the biggest differences is there was a lot more one goal losses this season than the previous season. The goal differential this season improved by a ton this year. Yeah, I think that was that's the mass. I mean, that goes into it with the with, with the, that twenty point improvement. And imagine if you can turn some of those one. I believe they finished with twenty three one goal losses. Mm-hmm. If you in in nine of those are in overtime alone, like if you can flip half of those, and it, it there's the what ifs. You know, if if some butts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. But that just isn't the way it goes. But with with those guys, it, it was impressive to see them step in. And I mean, Kelly Klang is. He was that piece in the trade coming over from Pittsburgh for the, the Raquel deal. Um, you know, they, they're very highly on him. They departed with that piece to, to come in and he made, you know, joined the club uh, towards the end, two years ago, towards the end of the season when his Swedish season finished up and you could see him continually get better. Um, he admitted himself, you know, talking to him after the game and so it was exit inter- after the uh, season and exit interviews, he had mentioned, you know, I f- don't think I was there right at the start, but, over the course of the year, you watched him progress and settle in and get more comfortable with this new life, well, lifestyle, too, on top of it. And the group in, in this professional game that you're riding the bus for and all across and flying around across the country and everything. So uh, he really settled in towards the end. You could tell he was happy towards the end of the season that I felt comfortable in my game where I was at. And now I need to know the steps I need to take to the next level. And a guy like Tomas Sukanik, who comes in out of nowhere, mm-hmm. I mean, it's I gush over the story because it's it's incredible. Like it it really is the underdog story uh, for a guy, especially for such a challenging position like goaltender, where you're uh, one of the best goalies. I mean, you're the best goalie at the World Junior Tournament. Um, you yep. backstop a a junior team in Tri City to uh, the postseason and everything, and, and co- constantly seeing 40, 35, 40 plus shots. 
uh, every night with that team, keeping them in it. Uh, can't earn a contract. So you get a tryout. You come in. You weren't even, you know, you were getting one period of that game against the L.A. Kings prospects at the, the rookie tournament in Las Vegas last year. Mm -hmm. He was so good in that tournament. We were there. It was – and lights out to the point that they're like, uh, yeah, like we got to – you got to give this kid the rest of the way. Wins that game, uh, comes back to camp, earns an AHL contract, starts in the ECHL. Um, this is a guy who was texting Jeff Glass, the, the Gauls goaltending coach, uh, in the midst of the losing streak. Call me up. I'm going to end the streak. That cocky. I, I, I could. When he told, when Zukanik told me that, I went to Jeff Glass. And I was like, "Can you confirm this happened?" He was like, "Yeah, it did. He did text me. Call, call me up. I'll break this streak and we'll start a new one." Sure enough, his, a his AHL debut is the first – it snaps a 13-game skid. It's in November, and, and, and he in his AHL debut and gets the victory and goes on a tear from there. Still can't get a contract until uh, – and then he signs a three-year entry-level deal in March. It's um, it, a guy that <laughs> believes – a lot of belief and confidence in himself um, to go through all of that to get to this point. Like it, it's uh, And on top of that, both, both goaltenders are great personalities and guys to talk to, and it just says a lot about the stable – for this organization that they have uh, between the pipes. And I remember that win specifically because I could see the body language as soon as he got that win. Like you could see the way that he reacted with his teammates. You could see the way that they were all just not a sense of relief, but a sense of, oh, it's early. Like we can still make some noise yeah. in this division because at the time the goals were, you know, bottom of the standings. And mm -hmm. you could see this slow ascension and you could see just the look on everyone's faces, the look that this is someone that we can get behind. Um, out of those guys, like, would you say Sukanik is one of those driving forces that kind of helped the goals get to a good spot and also might have helped during that PK streak as well? I mean, that all comes together, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think you, at that time during the streak, you, you just needed some sort of positivity, something to rally around to climb, get yourself out of it. I mean, there were there were games where they, I go back to seeing Charlotte come to town and you lose mm -hmm. one nothing. Like a one nothing game in regulation in 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 a league in a sport that scoring continues to go up, that's such a they, dagger. Okay, first off, those were good games between the Charlotte Checkers. I mean, they, they at least earned points in all those games. I think that was the mm -hmm. series to me where it said, "Gosh, what?" I think that's the biggest "what if" series of the season for me because mm -hmm. all of those games were close. Charlotte's a playoff team. You know, you're yeah. going to get a good shot from them, and the goals did give i thought was a couple of their best shots if one of those games or two of those games turn around what could that have done for the rest of the season that's why i call it like the biggest what if series of the season no completely agree those two games in because started first in, in charlotte you lose an over like you have the lead the whole way mm -hmm. they come back they they storm back they tie it late and win it over time like it, it those couple of things and it's again it just kind of further that that quicksand kind of hole that you were you were in where man, just continues everything we do. We just keep getting sucked down into this, into, into the quicksand here. Um, and you just wonder what, well, yeah, what could it have been if you, that, that those couple bounces go your way instead of Charlotte's way while you're in, you know, you're at the uh, Bojangles Coliseum. Um, again, we, we won't know. And, and I, I also, there's a handful of guys that I talked to after the season and Kelly Klang's one of them. Uh, you know, the question, just the question of what would you change? Some guys bring up the, the the losing streak, and you know I'd rather I'd like to be in the playoffs. But when you need a guy like Kelly Klang, like this, this all happened for a reason. We learned a lot out of this. Let's see. I want to see what happens next year. Now, like that's what's it, what it, what is that year in 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 the losing streak? And this what everybody kind of endured this past year. What is that? A lot of guys trial by fire as you mold that into what next season is going to be. Like that's where the question is: Are we going to have? Has this group learned the lessons? They've gone through some of those hard parts that we're going to be able to climb out of these holes much quicker. Where that thirteen game skid is now okay. It's three four. All right, we got to we got to bear down. We know we got to get to, we get done here. Um, that we'll have to wait and see. We're a few months away from figuring yeah. that one out, but maybe it is that thing where it's good you didn't change it. And yeah, we had to endure this one, but let's see what happens next year. I mean, something else that I looked at as far as bright spots <laughs> is. I love the way that the goals played against the Midwest division. Like for some reason, the goals had a winning oh. record against the Midwest. That was really cool to see the way they played Milwaukee. Who's a very good team, by the way, mm -hmm. the way they played, you know, out in Illinois, 
pretty solid teams. Mm-hmm. And there was there was a couple of blowouts, by the way, in there as well. I'm like, the goals just blew them out of the water. Like Rockford's like, a playoff team too. I mean, you, you handled them like they think you outscored them 12 to 3 in that in the two games yeah, there in something, Rockford. Something ridiculous like that just kind of spurs on the rest of the season. And in my mind, I'm going, if only the goals could play the Midwest all season long. If they were in the Midwest, they'd be in a playoff spot. It, yes, like that's, I think we've all, we put that one through our heads too. Like, I wonder if you could play more games that way. And um, you, look, what it comes down to is we know what the AHL is, and it is you play your division. It's a division league, you, you, it's all yeah. geographical. And I think the team knows too that 15 wins against your division, the, the, the least, and it just what it is, it's the least amount of division wins by any. AHL team this season that has to change because Mm -hmm. you are going to play Ontario eight to 10 times in Bakersfield, a Coachella Valley down the road, eight to 10 times. Like you've got to, it it would be nice. Yeah. And and maybe easier route, maybe not be the right way to to, to say it, but it it would be nice to be in the Midwest division with less teams and that kind of that competition, but you're in the Pacific and this is the hand you're dealt and you need to learn to win and play this what seems like a more physical, just difficult style of game that mm-hmm. can just beat you up over 72 games. And most of those teams with a slew of veterans, by the way. I mean, I've seen Coachella Valley every game, obviously. <laughs> um, a lot of veterans on that team. Ontario's got a bunch of talent on their team. Ontario used to be one of the best prospect pulls in the league until a team from further south <laughs> supplanted them on that. So I'm excited for that. Yeah. This is the this is the part of it. Like I think what we were talking, Jason, uh, before. I mean, we started this group started on opening day, opening night in Ontario with nine first year players playing. Um, yeah. at, at one point, eleven first year. Okay, th- guess what? Those guys are now second year players next year. They're sophomores, and I think there was a lot there was a lot of learning uh, mm-hmm. that went on in that in, during the the course of the season. And, and at the same time, Matt McIlvain, head coaches, it, it will tell you the exact same thing. He's learned a lot too. This was his, first, like, yeah. to think of what buttons you got to push with different guys when you were doing, you are playing, you are coaching in a completely different league for uh, the previous eight, 10 years um, in a different country, different side of the world, different. Everything's, everything's going to change. Now that everybody's got their feet dipped in and, and knows what to expect. I, 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 um, it, there's a lot of excitement in me too, to, to come to next year to see how we're, this group is going to build off of what they experienced into year number two yeah and we'll wrap up with that if you want to stick around for just a couple more minutes um as we head to the second intermission i got two intermissions here so we'll finish up naturally up. i would imagine there's two yeah on the other side now a brief word from FanDuel, if you can play um it's winner take all time in the nba and nhl and ahl playoffs as well and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. America, uh, FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook and the official sports betting partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. And please, folks, gamble responsibly. We're here with Aaron Cooney, the broadcaster extraordinaire from the San Diego Gold. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't heard extraordinaire before. <laughs> no, 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 not that one. It's just the, <laughs> the guy with the mouth. <laughs> you know, what I get in Coachella Valley is, oh, that loud mouth. <laughs> it's like that guy. And you you were in Coachella Valley. It gets loud in there, by the way. <laughs> I was impressed by that building. It is, it's, I mean great venue for a, for a hockey game and they get loud that last that those last two weekends those two sundays sold out especially fan appreciation night yeah. where, uh that's a fun place to be i can only imagine what playoffs is like and you know what did get loud was that section of san diego goals fans the start of that final game when they were up three nothing and the final moment of the season which i do want to talk about because i'm sitting there watching this and i did have a smirk on my face because it didn't matter for either team but to see Sasha Pastujov grow throughout the season and to have him wrap up and get the shootout goal. And I could see the players just come out and you could just see how happy they were for that moment. Like, even though it doesn't matter, it feels like a mm-hmm. good moment for the team to beat a quality club like the Firebirds in a shootout yeah. in that fashion. Absolutely. I mean, th- I that was another one. 
uh, so that was, that game was on a Sunday, and they had their rap meetings and the exit interviews that I was able to, to to get with the guys uh on um Monday the next day, and it was that was the first like this is the exclamation point on your season. Like you guys fully could have just packed it in end of the season, and all right, you know it's on to the off season. Um, no, like, did you like the way they were blocking shots with that three nothing lead? And I know it just dis- it disappeared, but to get through the second period when they were out shot is like something nineteen to three. To three. Like, okay, yeah, and it was like it was like oh boy, like here come the Firebirds. Um, but they they stood their ground and hung in there, and, and you know to to get it to the shootout, uh, to get to the overtime, get in the shootout, and, and finish that way. And Sasha Passage again, his journey through this season, mm-hmm. it took all the way until the trip. That you mentioned to Iowa for him to score his first goal, and of the seat of his first pro goal, and of and course he had a hat trick. trick. Oh, <laughs> it is, oh man! Four points like this is okay. Here we go. It just took it again. It's that learning process, and you know, for those rookies, you finish finish up. <clears throat> excuse me, with the most uh, contributions by your rookies in terms of goal scoring. Like the mm-hmm. Gauls' offense was thirty eight percent. Their goals supplied by rookies. Um, you ended up with six first, six double digit goal scorers that were first year players uh, on the San Diego Gulls roster. Um, Passage off was one of them when he came on towards the end. Uh, we saw Nathan Gauthier, another one that uh, for beginning of the season, I mean, this guy was front of the net and he was scoring everything from in tight. I think I had at one point the count I had was like his first five goals or five first six goals were all from within five feet of the net. And then we started to see some finish towards the end of the year where he was burying them on the rush in, in different plays, uh, yeah. tops of the circles, high slots. So you you're, saw that come through. We saw Nikita Nestorenko really come into his own uh, through the course of the season um, and find, f- for me, some consistency. Um, uh, it was a group that towards the end of the year, you just wonder if, if you had that team from January on, where, again, where would, where would they be? Would they be in a playoff spot right now? Would they be – Will we be doing the, the SoCal battle with Ontario right now? Uh, maybe, but um, you know that it is what it is. It, it, this is going to it was going to be a year of of learning and growth. And I think over the course of the season, you saw that. And, and this is the most important step. Next is what are these guys that are under contract on that ELC that are coming back next year? What are they doing to get ready for the next season and as second year pros? Bold prediction. Bold prediction time. I think we're going to have part four of that next year. <laughs> you think so? Or, it, it, you have to, right? Like, yeah, it's what it's what both That's fan when bases all look. the fans come what out. Everybody wants. <laughs> everybody wants to see that. It creates. It just makes I mean, it makes it that much more fun. It gives us. I, again, I can go back in my head with all of them. Twenty sixteen Ontario won in the second round. Twenty seventeen was the game five at Pachanga Arena, and two years ago, where. Yeah there was a sweep in Ontario where yep. Zellweger made his debut, by the way. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I could see it happening again for a fourth time. And every time both those teams come out, the fans come out, the players are really up for that SoCal series mm-hmm. every time. And, and that's, that was one. And if you look at all the, the, the series and where the Gauls won games in the division, it was for them against Ontario. Like there was a season mm-hmm. split between the two groups. Like that is a, uh, you can tell there's just that extra little juice in the building or, or, or the pep in the step from everybody when they get into that rivalry. And, and even for the first year guys, it's, they got that little bit of taste yep. of it. And by the end, you're like, I love coming in this building and I want to beat these guys here in at, at the at Toyota arena. I'm sure it's the same feeling over on the other side. I mean, it's the reason why Adrian Kempe loves playing John Gibson. <laughs> yeah. That rivalry goes back <laughs> to 2015. <laughs> When he had the juice, I believe, right? And that's how that whole thing yep. started. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a front row seat for that one too. Oh, memories. Um, before we wrap up, just a couple more bright spots for the future. We mentioned Sasha Pasujov, who I <laughs> love watching play. Um, goaltending, we mentioned. We haven't talked about the young defense a whole lot. I mean, there are some real bright spots down that way, if you want to touch on that for a second. No, abs- I mean, it's. I think it starts, one, when you look at what Anaheim did, I think, Pavel Minchikov and Jackson, like all the that group that ended up staying in Anaheim changed plans a little bit. Uh, it kind of seemed like. And then you you mean when you're looking at guys coming out of junior, you're thinking, hey, we, we're we're gonna get some pretty good defensemen now. We're gonna get some of these young guys. Um, and to, and it didn't happen. Like that's how good some of that crew was. Uh, but you get Olin Zellweger down here. I mean, this 
the guy still finished. He played 38 games and still finished in the top 20 in defensive scoring, um, yep. tied for the lead in power play goals amongst the like that's how good of a year he had in, in, in just that short of time in an AHL all-star. Um, and you just wonder what, what it could have been for the rest of the season. Now, again, it, it comes the same thing and it, it's, you hear it from fans too. And it's why well, they keep taking our players. It's like, well, this is what the goals are here to do and get them ready to go. And Olin Zellweger quickly jumped up and made an, an impression uh, on the group. I mean, that is what the AHL, like the AHL is a feeder team for the Anaheim Ducks. Yeah who themselves are still trying to figure things out with all their young players. I think next season is going to be a very big turning point in the right direction because now the Ducks organization has a slew of young defensemen and they can't all fit in Anaheim's roster. So some of them are going to come to San Diego. It, it's true. Like, and, and, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss uh, to not talk about like, like a guy like Tyson Hines, who, um, Kind of weren't sure what was gonna where where he was gonna kind of shake out, and he ended up playing every game but one, uh, yeah. and had himself a solid season. It's I think that was a lot of learning for him too. But uh, Tyson Hines, big, has that size, can can jump in on the rush. We we saw that a few times, and and take care of home on the PK or whatever it may be. Um, there's there's a lot of this group, and again, we'll see what the next that that yeah, crop Drew also coming out of junior Drew Hellison. I thought was outstanding the last two, three months of the season, like to another level when he came back from injury after, uh, after Texas. And um, I mean, just the last couple of games against Coachella Valley to, to the home and mm home -hmm. um, racked up. I think it was uh, four or five wow. assists over the last seven games. Uh, and like that, th there's a guy you could tell wants to be a leader. And that was another interview that stuck with me. He was another one that, you know, it was, this sucks not playing. I want to be in the playoffs. I'm like, all right, this this guy's going to put in the work and have be yep. ready to go for a good season or uh, the off season, be ready to go for next year. Yeah, I think I think I think the goals do make the playoffs. I mean, I'm going to be the optimist here, but I do think playoffs are in the future. Plus, to your point, there's going to be some guys from other teams that are going to retire or they're going to move on. Bakersfield's <laughs> about to lose a bunch of guys. I I know their captain just retired, so invariably those teams are going to begin to kind of fade away. Yeah, and there's a spot right there for the picking to just jump well there, in. and I I think um, you'll see a lot more young groups come or the young group really take over in Coachella Valley after this season too. Like you're now you got three drafts full of prospects. You're going to see more guys that need time, and, and I'm, I imagine we're going to see a lot of Ty Nelson uh, in the next couple of years here. I, um, I think what but, you're saying is in two years the top two teams are going to be San Diego Coachella Valley. I think it's what you're saying. There we go. <laughs> But there's there's definitely going to be there's going to be room. There's always that shakeup. Um, so it's curious to see you put the right mix in. Uh, I think San Diego. I was just I was uh, playing around on elite prospects myself to see where we're at. It's it's still a pretty young group based off of mm -hmm. the, the the entry level guys that are coming back next season. Um, but it's a it is a solid core now that has been through all the ups and downs that was last year. Um, a lot yeah, of that group I, played 70, 65 to seventy games. Um, kind of know what it takes now. I also play on elite prospects and I also look at some of the prospects that are in the pool. And I looked at mm -hmm. Tristan Luno and Noah Warren's name. I'm like, Ooh, we kind of forgot about them a little bit. I mean, of course, yeah. injury is part of that, but if they're fully healthy, watch out rest of the league. Like, That's it. And Cedar off is another one. And mm -hmm. that was signed. And uh, so Peach, I believe uh, Colson Petrie was another one that was signed. You, you know, mm -hmm. he, he finished his playoffs and was injured. Um, is unable to come and, and play just after the OHL wrapped up. But these are these are guys right right on the cusp here. And uh, I, for me, that's also creates more competition. I think competition creates oh, even it's good. more. It's right, it's good. good for everybody, um, and that's going to make things even more interesting when we get to training camp days and and then into roster battles. I cannot wait for that. Um, Aaron, we're going to wrap up here, but where can the fine folks find you? Where can they find you online and all that jazz? Yeah. Uh, follow me on X formerly known as Twitter at Aaron underscore Cooney. Uh, you can check out all the Gulls uh, podcasts through our website, but look for our, that's the, the one that I host is our kind of flagship podcast called from the nest. Um, that I'll do weekly throughout the season. I'll check in during the summer. Um, Gauls All Access on, on YouTube through the Gauls YouTube page. Catch us there and some of those interviews that we had with uh, the likes of Josh Lapina, Tomas Sukanik, uh, and you name it throughout the season. 
at some point you got to get more guys surfing out there just for just for the sake of we need gopros like gonna do it right like we're gonna have to get them like on on gopros and everything this is gonna be a segment on on gauze all access at some point that's gotta be <laughs> and um you could find me jason hernandez on the sidelines at Coachella Valley Firebirds games, but you know, also um, contributing to Defend the Nest once in a while. And you could find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, ad free on Amazon, and also on the YouTubes. So check that out as well. Um, am I forgetting anything? Oh, yeah. Uh, you could email me at locked on Anaheim Ducks at gmail.com. I almost forgot. And yeah, it was a good time. So, Aaron, thanks for coming on. Hope you can come on again at some point. <laughs> Absolutely, day. Jason. Thanks for having me. Glad we get this set up, man. I would, uh, and I would absolutely love to check in here uh, when we get closer to the season and, and kicking off. Or after the, the after the draft would be a good time, actually, because maybe do that prospect. too. This is true. More to talk about. More yep. more players to talk about. Yep. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. For Aaron and myself, for Locked On Ducks, I'm Jason JD Hernandez. Saying, have a great rest of this beautiful SoCal afternoon. Please remember to be safe out there. Be kind to one another. And ducks and gulls fly together. Oh, there it is. Quack, quack, and caw, caw, everybody. <laughs>